St. Paul admonishes the Thessalonians today with the words, No brothers and sisters, love my God, how you were chosen. We were chosen by God without any merit on our part. Before we even existed, before there was anything good about us, God chose us. That's something very beautiful. Something similar happened to Cyrus, to whom God said in today's second reading, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, Cyrus, whose right hand I grasp, for the sake of Jacob my servant, of Israel my chosen one, I have called you by your name, giving you a title, though you knew me not. God actually chose this pagan, Cyrus, in order to save his people, Israel. He had no merits, there was nothing about him that merited that, but God chose him to save his people, Israel. And so it is for each one of us. God chose us to give us life, to guard us, to share his own life with us, and even today to give us himself in the Most Holy Eucharist. What a beautiful thing to be chosen by God and loved by God. Now the only appropriate response is to choose God in our turn and to do to others as God has done to us. To choose for the life of others, to guard others, to protect them. And we do that by fulfilling the two great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second commandment, which is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is how we respond to God's choice for us. October is a month of the rosary. And so in a special way, we pray. We pray in the coming weeks for our country. We pray the rosary. And we entrust ourselves to Our Lady of Guadalupe, who is not only the patroness of uh, our diocese, but of all the Americas. So especially we pray in this month of October, the rosary for our nation and for our diocese, to Our Lady of Guadalupe. And October is also Respect Life Month. And once again, the words of Moses to God's people apply also to us. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life that you and your children may live. God is pro-life. He wants us to choose life. Sadly, many Catholics have been deceived into believing that their faith has no place in the public forum. We have been told that we cannot be good citizens and faithful Catholics. The recent hearings, I think, kind of manifest this for the Supreme Court. We're told that our beliefs have no place in the life of our nation and that we do not count. Though Catholics comprise one quarter of this nation's citizens, though we have contributed greatly to the common good of our country through Catholic schools, through hospitals, through social services, Though we have honestly paid our taxes, and all I might add, because of our Catholic faith, yet we are told to keep our faith quiet and private when it comes time to choose our representatives. Apparently, we're not supposed to choose anyone who represents us. <laughs> and apparently, this injunction applies only to Catholics, as if only Catholic beliefs are illegitimate. But I would like to point out that a system of government where each person has a right to choose according to their own beliefs, it has a name. We call it democracy. We live in a democratic system. So don't let anyone tell you you can't choose representatives who represent you. Don't let anyone ever tell you that. These people are like new Pharisees. They want to trick Catholics into remaining silent in the public forum. They tell us not to choose those who represent our values or even speak publicly in defense of the unborn or of marriage and family. They say that we are being political when we ought to keep those ideas to ourselves. So how are we today to distinguish between the things of Caesar and the things of God? How do we do that? The principle that our Lord laid down those many centuries ago in today's gospel holds true today. If today someone came to Jesus and asked him this question, should we obey civil authority when it protects the taking or manipulation of innocent human life? When it sanctions unnatural substitutes for the human family? I suppose Jesus would say to them, 
Bring me a child. Bring me the human family. Whose image do you find there? And whose inscription? Then he would quote for us the words from Genesis. God created man in his image. In the divine image he created him. Male and female he created them. Therefore, render unto God the things that are God's. That is our duty before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus said that Christians are the light of the world, that we're a city on a hill. He told us not to hide our land under a bushel basket. He commanded us to teach all nations the saving truths of the gospel. We cannot be private disciples of Christ. This is itself contrary to the gospel, since we must love our neighbor enough to share with him the good news of salvation. St. John Chrysostom said, It is easier for the sun not to shine and give warmth than for a Christian not to share his faith in love. If we're not sharing our faith, we're not really Christians. So this whole idea of a private faith, that's not Christianity. Our faith is by nature public. We're commanded. We're not suggested that we should share our faith. We're commanded to do it. Now, nearly all of the martyrs died because they would not keep silent in the face of injustice contrary to the law of God. John the Baptist died for defending the sanctity of marriage. He was told by Herod and his wife Herodias to, to be quiet, to keep his faith to himself. Most of the early Roman martyrs died in witness to the truth that there was only one God. Idols are not gods. Caesar was not God. Countless martyrs died under the communist and Nazi regimes, those atheistic regimes, because they would not remain silent about injustice. So will we ally ourselves with those noble witnesses who, out, who throughout the ages shed their blood in the ultimate testimony to Christ? Or will we disown them? How can we claim to be Christians when the weakest, the most innocent members of our society, unborn children, are being systematically destroyed, and we refuse to exercise our rights as citizens to stop this unspeakable crime against humanity. In this time of year, once again, we are presented with the choice between life and death. And some of the candidates have pledged to defend life from conception to natural death, others to defend a right to abortion on demand. Most do so unapologetically. It used to be that abortion was supposed to be rare. It's supposed to be tolerated as a lesser evil. Today it's proclaimed as a right, something really good, to make men and women equal. You know, one of my big problems with modern feminism that shows its head in the United States, its first principle is that men are better than women. Because they want women to become men. That's the first principle of modern feminism. They don't recognize the beauty of women, their own distinct goodness. Women are not just defective men. <laughs> and your fertility is not a curse. That's just the wrong way to think about women and the relationship between women and men. And if someone thinks that we need abortion so that men will respect women, well, how's that turned out? I'll tell you how that's turned out. Now that we have abortion, men treat women like chattel. Just throw them away, use them, go get an abortion if you got pregnant. If you want men to respect women, then respect what a woman does that no man can do. Bring life into the world. One of my dearest friends told me about his wife's first labor. It was a very difficult labor for their first child. And he told me with tears in his eyes how he had never respected his wife more and when he saw the suffering that she was going through in order to give life to their child, to his son. That's how a man learns to respect a woman. He sees something that she can do that he just can't do. <laughs> and we have to reject that idea that women need to reject their fertility if they're ever going to be good enough. It's just not the truth. Now, it is true that some will try to justify abortion as a necessary evil to preserve a greater good. We must defend the right to choose, they say. That is a lie. They are not even pro-choice. 
How can someone claim to defend choice by snuffing out a whole lifetime of choices, beautiful, peaceful choices, by a single, brutal, final choice? That little child will never ever choose to smile at its mom or dad, will never ever choose to say, I love you, mommy. That child will never choose to run and play in the fields, will never choose who will be its friends. She will never choose to marry. She'll never choose to have her own children. She'll never choose as she's dying to embrace her children and to tell them to love God above all things. Though all those choices wiped out, how can you claim to be pro-choice when you won't even give a little child the choice to live or die? Others will say, we are helping women who are in difficult situations. That is a lie. We do not help women by teaching them to take the easy way out, to use violence to get what they want. Mother Teresa of Calcutta used to say, abortion is the greatest destroyer of peace in the world because if we tell women, mothers, that they can kill even their own children, how can we tell others not to kill one another? And if you love someone, you don't help them to destroy their children. You help them to raise their children. That's what happens when you love someone. St. Paul once wrote, love does no harm to the neighbor. Hence, love is a fulfillment of the law. And who is more the neighbor of a woman than her unborn child who rests nestled in her womb, depending completely upon her for life and safety? By abortion, women are not helped to love in difficult circumstances, and so they are not helped become happy. Isn't that what we want? We want happiness, true hot happiness, not a false happiness, not a life filled with regret. Now there's a more subtle deception by which the devil hopes to persuade believers into perpetuating the holocaust of abortion. He tries to confuse them by placing abortion side by side with other problems, like health care and poverty and the environment. The devil tries to convince the Christian that it is okay to choose a pro-abortion candidate because they are better about health care, poverty or the environment or some other social issue. Sadly, even bishops have been deceived by such fallacious reasoning. So sad. But this reasoning is also a lie. The most fundamental good upon which all other goods rest is life itself. Without life, there is no health. Without life, there is no economy. I'd rather be poor and alive than dead. <laughs> if each child alive in the womb today could make their voice heard, could make their choice, in the coming days, you can be sure their primary concern would not be health care or the economy or the environment. Their primary concern would be that more than one third of them will die by abortion before they see the light of day. And you can be sure that unborn children would be 100% pro-life. As Ronald Reagan famously quipped, I see that all of you who are in favor of abortion have already been born. <laughs> we Catholics must be the voice for these silent ones. We're supposed to be for the underdog as Catholics. We're supposed to be. We must choose on their behalf. If I told you that a third of you will be violently killed in the next nine months unless abortion ends in our country, I know how you would choose. So it really comes down to this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's a question. Do you really love your neighbor as yourself? Do you love the unborn child in the womb as you love yourself? Will you choose for them the way you would choose for yourself? The first duty of a ruler is to defend the lives of his citizens. Our children are our country's greatest natural resource. If a person will not defend the right to life, how serious can he be about those other rights? A person who believes that it is acceptable to take the life of an innocent, helpless child is not even fit to be a citizen, much less a ruler of a civilized nation. 
Since abortion was legalized in our nation, over 60 million innocent lives have been taken by abortion. Jesus suffered terribly and died for each and every one of those innocent children. And they didn't even have the chance to be baptized. Those are God's children. Do you think that their blood does not cry from the earth for justice? Choose who you like. It's a free country. But I, for one, do not want to stand before God and those 60 million souls to render an account of my pro-abortion choice on Judgment Day, when God will cast the final ballot on my soul.